Okay, in this last lecture of this module, we're going to be discussing uh, some of the effects of groups on our behavior. Um, so when we join groups, what type of ways will that affect uh, the ways we behave or interact with one another? So one of the things we can take a look at is uh, the size of groups and the ways that that influences us. So we have some specific names for some of the uh, smallest types of groups. A dyad uh, consists of two individuals. Okay, so if we wanted to kind of illustrate that, we might just draw it as two people with one connection between them. That would be considered a dyad. Um, so some of the characteristics of a dyad is that it is definitely the most intense type of relationship, clearly because when we talk about the number of interactions you have, uh, you can only interact with one other person. So that relationship is, by definition, going to be rather intense uh, or intimate. Uh, the other characteristic we can say about a dyad is that it is also the most vulnerable to collapse. In other words, it is the most easily uh, kind of dissolved relationship that there is because, again, look at the, the definition of, or the, the uh, idea of what it is, uh, for a dyad not to exist, only one person out of the two needs to walk away. So one person can dissolve the relationship by simply not participating in it. So we would say that a dyad is a very intense relationship, but also very vulnerable to collapse. A triad is the addition of one other person. So we could describe that uh, thusly, one other person with another two people, a dyad with another person involved. Um, so we could say, now what are the characteristics of this relationship? Well, now we have three people with three possible interactions or relationships between them. Uh, so those relationships will necessarily uh, not be as intense or intimate as the relationships in a dyad. However, we can also say that a triad uh, is also less vulnerable to collapse as a group. So if one person were to leave the triad, there would still be two people left over. A dyad would still exist. So we see this trend continue. So again, I'm not going to write all this up here, but as small groups grow larger, they become more stable, but the relationships within them become less intense. So if you have four people, uh, you would have six relationships. I'll give a quick example of that. So if you were to have four people, right, you would have one, two, three, four, five, six possible relationships within that group. Uh, once again, if you have five people, you have 10 relationships, uh, six people, 15 relationships, seven people, 21 relationships, etc., etc. So as group sizes get larger, the relationships become less intense, but the stability of the group improves. In other words, if one or more people leave, there's still a sizable number of people and still a sizable number of relationships that can exist within the group. The other main thing that begins to exist as we talk about the movement from dyads to triads is the introduction, perhaps, that all these relationships may not be completely equal. Uh, that some people's relationships may be stronger uh, towards some people within the group than others. So if we were to say over here in our example of triads, the relationship between these people becomes much stronger than the relationship perhaps between uh, the other people involved. Oh, there we go. We've now introduced something we would call a coalition. So the idea that the, the bonds between those two people, linked by red, is stronger than the relationship they have toward that third person. We've now introduced, and if you're a big fan of uh, reality shows like Survivor, and I've heard the word coalition before, again, that's when some people develop stronger bonds than the bonds toward other people. Uh, so those can exist in any group, obviously, above the size of a dyad. So once again, as groups get uh, bigger and more formal, then we start to see not only more stability of the group itself, but less intense relationships and the possibility for uh, these things uh, we call coalitions. Another, uh, as groups get larger, another phenomenon we see is something we call the diffusion of responsibility, um, sometimes called not my problem or, uh, again, not my backyard syndrome, those kind of things. 
Uh, the example I usually give of this, if it's, let's go back to the example of a triad. If you and one other person were sitting in a room, let's say a library, a classroom, working on something, and the fire alarm went off, it would be pretty reasonable to expect that the two of you would quickly uh, look at each other and say, that's the fire alarm, let's get up and walk out of here, and you'd probably evacuate the room rather quickly. Uh, and I actually had the pleasure of using this example uh, one semester in a class where this exact same thing happened. So if you have a, a room below full of, let's say, 20 or 30 people, and the alarm goes off, what's likely to happen? People are much more likely to look around at each other and not act. So uh, one of the other things we definitely see as group size increases, we see this diffusion of responsibility where uh, the group as a whole tends to react to stimuli with less urgency. In other words, an alarm goes off and everybody looks at each other and there's a, just a general hesitation. Who's going to do something first? And if nobody does anything, uh, then it's likely that, that a whole room full of people might be sitting there when, again, a teacher or somebody like that enters the room and says, don't you hear the alarm going off? Why didn't you get up and leave the room? And, of course, nobody will probably admit this, but the answer is, I was waiting to see what other people would do. Okay? So we definitely see that uh, this diffusion of responsibility, actually, as social creatures, as much of a social creatures as we are, we tend to find very large groups uh, to be somewhat distracting because kind of instinctually, or I guess a better word is socially, we find it difficult to maintain that many interactions with individuals at one time. And large groups will generally tend to break down into smaller, more manageable groups. Again, the example I usually give, um, if you go to a party or a social event, you know, uh, let's say you go to a party where there's 20 people at somebody's house, is it likely that those 20 people are all standing or sitting in a large circle where they can all interact with each other? Probably not. That would probably be pretty distracting to most of us and we would find ourselves pretty uncomfortable with that situation. So even if you were at a dinner party and you were sitting at a big long table, it's unlikely that you're going to be trying to interact with people who are much farther away from you than one or two people away. And certainly when we're given the freedom uh, to move about, we then tend to cluster into smaller groups. So you would find one group of people talking about something over here, maybe a group of three or four, and another group of people with another shared interest talking somewhere else. So large groups, unless they're, like I said, they're incredibly rigidly form or, uh, formalized, uh, tend to break down into smaller and more manageable groups. Uh, when we introduce, uh, again, the idea of group dynamics, and this kind of comes back to the idea of diffusion of, of responsibility, if, let's say, the alarm goes off in a crowded classroom, uh, probably the class might not move until one person probably stands up and says, that's the fire alarm, come on, let's leave, and everybody would look to that person. We would probably then refer to that person as a leader. Okay? A leader is somebody who influences the behaviors, opinions, or attitudes of a group. Okay? And this is one of those times when I definitely make the, uh, the statement that you know, learning this is a, is, is a practical application. This has a practical application because most people who enter the workforce uh, or even continuing in college uh, are going to be hopefully put in positions in which you're uh, asked to be or required to be some type of leader. And we typically think of leaders in kind of a one-dimensional way as there's only one type of leadership. And as you can see here, it's actually two different types and three different styles of leadership and knowing what situations call for what specific blends of these types and styles of leadership can actually be very, like I said, practical. I'll give you, uh, we'll talk about these definitions real quickly and I'll give you some examples. So an instrumental leader is a leader who attempts to keep a group moving toward goals. Okay, it's their, that leader's job, his or her job, to get the group to a specific goal. Right? Whereas an expressive leader is much more interested in the overall kind of harmony and morale of the group. So in other words, uh, kind of, you could say, kind of concerned with making sure everyone uh, is happy or contented in what they're doing and the, and the procedure toward goals becomes kind of secondary. Right? Within the styles, we have uh, listed up here authoritarian. An authoritarian style of leadership is a person who basically directs people without getting a lot of uh, what we call uh, 
consensus. So the idea of I'm just going to tell you what to do, I'm not really interested in hearing your suggestions or feedback, uh, I'm not going to give a lot of necessarily, like I said, reinforcement, um, kind of, you know, just arbitrary uh, praise if that's necessary, but just the idea of I'm going to tell you what to do and that that's the style of leadership. A democratic leader, uh, that style of leadership is much more interested in gaining the consensus of the group. So asking for people's opinions, uh, kind of weighing checks and balances, or trying to kind of come along with a solution that might be uh, uh, welcome or uh, acceptable by at least the majority, if not everybody, uh, in the group. And then the very last one is kind of laissez-faire. Uh, and specifically, uh, that means, in French, hands off. Okay? So again, the, the style of leadership would be to maybe put a group on a direction, but then with very little supervision or feedback, just kind of then let them go their own way. Okay? So now let's talk about a couple of different examples. So we have these two types and three styles of leadership. Uh, if we were all together in one place, kind of in a traditional classroom setting, and I were to say, okay, I'm forming a softball team, and we are going to play uh, the other classes at the campus we're at, or the other classes within the social sciences department, and I want to win. Okay, I want uh, our sociology, our intro to sociology class to be the best, and I want that trophy. What type and style of leadership, if I'm assuming I'm going to be the coach or manager of the team, are we going to, am I going to employ? I would clearly say that I would probably employ an instrumental authoritarian style of leadership. Okay, our goal is to win, and I'm, as a coach, I'm going to uh, use an authoritarian style of leadership. So instead of just showing up at practice and saying, okay, who wants to do batting practice? Or want, I would say, okay, we're going to run laps, uh, then we're going to do batting practice, and then we're going to do some fielding exercises, and then we're going to do some more laps, and then we're out of here. Okay? And I don't necessarily want to hear your opinion about what you want to do or hear any complaints, right? I'm just I'm directed at a goal, and I'm going to tell you how to get there. Okay? Authoritarian or instrumental authoritarian leadership. If you were going out with a group of friends for the weekend, would that be the type of leadership you would use? Well, I'd sometimes I'd say, hopefully not. So in other words, it would be kind of ridiculous to assemble a group of friends and say, okay, I've mapped out our entire agenda for the evening. Uh, we're going out to dinner. You're each going to have one cocktail and an appetizer, and then I've already ordered uh, your meals for you, so they're all ready when we get there. And then we're going to go to the movies. I've already picked the movie. Don't worry about it. You're just going to be giving your tickets, and I'll tell you where to sit and who to sit next to. And then we're going to go out to the club, and you're going to dance for 45 minutes, and you're allowed to have two more cocktails. And then we're going to wrap the whole thing up at 1130. Okay. Once again, instrumental authoritarian leadership, but not necessarily the best type of leadership called for by that social situation. We would probably say you'd much want to be an expressive democratic leader in going out with a group of friends, trying to gain the group's uh, consensus. What does everybody like to do? Try and do maybe uh, you know gain, uh, gain uh, the majority. Uh, even for those people in the minority, then you want to kind of make them feel like they have something to say in it. Or let's do this and then do this. Uh, and what's the goal? Is to make sure that everybody's having a good time. Okay, that you're not necessarily trying to achieve a specific set of goals, such as, like I said, uh, you, know, you would with a softball team, but that everybody, that the morale of the group is very high by giving people as much say as they possibly can and trying to gain consensus. Okay, so two different very styles of leadership. Uh, the example I often give for laissez-faire uh, is, again, very related to things like classwork where your, your instructor might say to you, uh, give you a group project at one week and then say you've got four or six weeks to complete it and say I'm always here for questions. So again, that might be an example of instrumental laissez-faire leadership. Okay, Here's the goal, this is the due date, go do it. Right? However you feel fit, consult with the library, look up your own sources, if you need me I'm here, I'll give you some guidance, but for the most part I'm going to give you the assignment, I'm going to give you a due date and you get it done however you so we can clearly see that there's not just one type or style of leadership and that knowing when to mix and match these various types
can be very practical uh, in its application. Okay, um, to kind of wrap this section up, we can talk about when people get together in groups, what are some of the other dynamics or things that affect their behavior. I think we're all associated with the idea of peer pressure. Okay, what is peer pressure? It's generally the uh, desire to kind of conform to a group, um, to gain the approval of the group, to try to do, and sometimes that influences our behavior to a large degree. Sometimes even uh, influencing our behavior to the point where we do things which we may not have been socialized to do or things that we might even know to be wrong uh, or self-injurious or uh, illegal even uh, to gain the consensus of the group. Um, again, a lot of times when we hear peer pressure, what do we think of? We think of uh, teens in school and peer groups. So a mother and father have raised their child their entire life not to drink or smoke or do drugs and that child then is going to be subject to the pressure of peers to experiment with those things. You know, come on, do it, you'll be cool, those kind of things. So peer pressure, uh, a lot of times it's our desire to conform to the standards of a group that sometimes even conflicts with our own desires. Uh, when we talk about authority, we usually kind of direct that as the idea of pleasing a kind of a central figure or a, a, a figure that we generally kind of deem or uh, recognize has either the power to reward us for behavior that the authority figure wants or punish us for doing things that the authority figure doesn't want us to do. So a lot of times when we get into groups, especially groups that have very strong leaders, uh, we could say that we conform our behavior to that authority figure. So once again, going back to our softball example, if, you know, again, I'm the coach and you bought into this idea of belonging to the class and wanting to win or at the very least not wanting to get a bad grade by dis, you know, displeasing your coach slash teacher, uh, then you would say, why am I running laps on a hot day or why am I doing batting practice when I clearly hate this activity? You would probably say I'm doing it because I feel that an authority figure is telling me to do it and I either want to gain a reward or avoid punishment from that authority figure. So once again, we're conforming our behavior to a group. Now this very last notion, this idea of groupthink, um, I relate this a lot to the author George Orwell, uh, which if you're familiar with Orwell and some of his most famous works, probably his most famous work, uh, which has gained a lot of increasing notoriety uh, just in the past couple of years. Um, one of his most famous works was a book by the uh, title of 1984, um, which he wrote in 1948 switched the last few digits to get a future date. But in 1948, Orwell was attempting to write about what he considered the future, um, and he wrote about a society in which both the um, uh, aspects of peer pressure and authority control people's behavior. So if you're familiar with the novel at all, uh, it involves an authority figure by the name of Big Brother, and the peer pressure was the uh, joining of what was called the, the party, so it was a, a politically based novel, um, and the, the uh, protagonist, the hero of the, the novel, Winston, uh, clearly dealt with the idea of what it was like to be under pressure to conform to the party as well as uh, direct your behavior, direct his behavior, uh, toward pleasing Big Brother, and that's where we get the phrase Big Brother is watching, if you're familiar with that reality show, you know where that comes from. The idea of groupthink is when you get large people, large numbers of people in any society into a group and subject them to peer pressure and authority, uh, it's, it's possible to get human beings to do just about anything. Um, and that's a scary notion. And when we think about some of the most uh, dramatic examples of human behavior, especially human negative behavior uh, that we can think of, we can usually put it down to this notion of groupthink. Okay? So an example uh, often given is the Holocaust. So we talk about Nazi Germany in the 1930s and 40s uh, and the extermination of 12 million people at the hands of generally a very small group within the society. And we can wonder, how could something like that happen? Uh, was there peer pressure? Well, clearly, the Nazi party being the, the, the um, uh, party in power, there was a huge desire to either conform to 
the, the party if you were a member, or at the very least, not cross them, or in other words, not do anything that would get the Nazi party down on you. Uh, so in other words, kind of a conformity to this idea of the pressure of the peers uh, within the society. And clearly, if we're talking about Nazi Germany, uh, both pre and during World War II, the authority figure would have been clearly Adolf Hitler. And it's no uh, surprise that uh, in German, the title he chose for himself was Der Führer, which literally translates to the father. And most of us can ma not imagine much more of an authority figure than your father, and that you know, the, the, the salute and uh, the uh, salutation of Zeke Heil, that idea of uh, pleasing an authority figure. And when you put those two things together, the idea of peer pressure and authority, once again, um, there is a lot of uh, room for a lot of behavior in human beings. Uh, so again, some other very dramatic behavior that we've seen, uh, uh, suicide cults, Branch Davidians in Waco, Texas, um, you know, groups that uh, commit mass suicide, uh, Jonestown or Jim Jones in, in French Guyana, or um, uh, uh, cults that commit suicide at the approach of omens or uh, uh, meteorites, those kind of things. These are all things that we can put down to behavior resulting from groupthink. The idea that there's only one way to think, we sometimes talk about as having blinders on, that encourage only one way of thinking, and that think outside of that orthodox type of thinking uh, amounts to basically betrayal of either the group or the authority figure. So I've included a video uh, in the D2L shell, which you're free to watch uh, after we've concluded this. Uh, it is just a uh, trailer for the movie adaption of Orwell's novel, 1984. Uh, it's just a couple minutes long, but uh, once again, if you're thinking about this idea of groupthink and think about the influence of peer pressure and authority, as you're watching this clip, uh, try to um, identify the things you see in this, uh, like I said, three or four minute trailer uh, for this film uh, into examples of that. And feel free to use that as well in your discussion board or essay posts. Okay?